coupe style SUVs are supposed to be the sportier version of the conventional SUV that they're based upon. So why does this new Havel H6 GT coupe style SUV have no changes to the powertrain, any changes to the chassis? And well, it's just a different roof line, or is it? In this review, we're gonna take a deep dive into the H6 GT and what makes it different to the regular Havel H6, and there's much more than meets the eye. If you wanna read all about it, my full detailed review covers everything you'll need to know. You can find the link in the description below if you're watching on YouTube. First off, in this video, we're gonna look at the design because that's where the biggest changes are. I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. I've never been a fan of a coupe style SUV, and this car isn't necessarily gonna change my mind. But for people who do like this style of vehicle, there are some really interesting design elements that you're probably gonna dig about this H6 GT. Let me show you. So obviously you get this swooping roof line and this ducktail style spoiler at the back. So it's got a completely different look at the rear to the regular H6 and we'll show you a shot of that now so you've got a bit of context about what I'm talking about. So obviously the GT version gets these distinct model specific tail lights, which I think are actually pretty sharp. They look quite nice. This black spoiler and there's other bits of this design that I'm not loving that much. This carbon fiber finish across here. And then there's these, the chrome exhaust finishes, but the exhausts actually don't pop out of the bumper. So it's kind of a mishmash at the back. And the thing I actually dislike most about the rear end design is the badges. They're too big and there's too many of them. And if I was buying this car, the first thing I'd do is get rid of them to clean up this design. Other sporty elements. You've got another spoiler up here on the roof. You've got these little flicks that come up off the side skirts and they add a level of interest. Then you've got these 19 inch black alloy wheels. Now you get 19s on both grades, but only on the top spec do you get Michelin tires. They're not the sportiest Michelins you can get, but at least that's something. I just wish that they pushed out a little bit further from the body because they do sit a fair way inboard and look just a bit dopey to me. And yes, those are fluorescent green or are they yellow? brake calipers. Up front is where the H6 GT arguably offers its most interesting angle. The front bumper and this grille finish is much more aggressive than the standard H6. And to me, it looks intimidating and quite angry and I actually really like the front end look of this car. In fact, our videographer decided that he'd call it, well, inspired by the Lamborghini Urus, but maybe a Urus from wish.com. Inside, there are some sporty design flourishes, thanks to the part leather and fake suede trim, while the dashboard and console design are pretty much similar to what you see in the regular H6, which really isn't that bad, but there are still some serious ergonomic and user interface concerns, which we'll get to shortly. If you're liking the look of what you're seeing so far, the Havel H6 GT comes in two different grades. Here's some details. The entry level model is called the Lux, and from the outside you'll be hard pressed to pick it from the top spec model. That's because both the base grade and the top spec score nice bits like 19 inch black alloy wheels, LED headlights and taillights, electric tailgate, the sporty body kit with rear spoilers and more. It's just over $40,000 and that's a national drive away price at the time of the launch. So it seems pretty good value for the Lux if you can deal with two wheel drive, because if you step up to the Ultra, you score all wheel drive and the system includes multiple drive modes and plenty of other items to justify the price hike up to more than 46 grand drive away. The top spec model also adds a panoramic sunroof, wireless phone charging, electrically adjustable front passenger seat in addition to electric driver's seat, ventilated front seats in addition to heated front seats in the base grade, a heated steering wheel, a 12.3 inch media screen, which is bigger than the base grade car, a head up display and the aforementioned Michelin tire upgrade. There's also an automated parking system, mood lighting and more. There may be other grades available of the H6 GT over time, but at the moment with these two versions that are available at launch, it's hard not to see this vehicle as compelling value for money. But what does it stack up like when it comes to practicality? It is a coupe SUV after all, let's find out. So does it feel very different to the regular H6 in here? In short, 
Yes and no, because this GT model obviously gets these lovely GT seats, which have an Alcantara and fake leather trim to them. And they look pretty nice and they're pretty comfortable. Although I will say for my driving position, I just can't quite get it right because the base, you can't adjust the front of the base up. So I sort of feel like I'm leaning forward driving this car a lot of the time, which isn't ideal. Um, also not ideal is the button placement or the lack of buttons. So this screen itself is big and crisp and pretty clear um, and mostly easy enough to use, but that's when you're sitting still. When you're driving, it's really difficult to use because so much of what you need to interact with in this car is run through this screen. So I'll give you an example. If you're say on Apple CarPlay and you wanna go and change the air conditioning to be recirc because maybe there's some stinky trucks outside or something. So that you'll need to either go back to your Havel menu, then you have to go into the air conditioning menu and then hit a button in that screen. And it will return you back to Apple CarPlay, but it's just not as simple as a button would be. And that's one of the things that happens when uh, brands cost cut by removing buttons because software is cheaper than buttons. And so that's what's happening here. It just isn't as user-friendly as it could be. Also not as user-friendly as it could be is the driver information screen. I've almost gotten used to it, but I really just think that it could be easier with the controls on the steering wheel. It's just a bit out of whack. Nothing's quite where it needs to be and the buttons don't do what you probably expect they should do. And that also comes down to when you're using the adaptive cruise control. I really struggled to figure it out. Um, I did get it to work eventually, but it's not the best adaptive system that I've sampled. And when I take you for a drive, uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about the safety systems and some of the annoying things that they do. Now, in terms of storage, you've got bottle holders and storage bins in each of the front doors. You've also got a flip up little console here, which is a decent size. There's also this console here. And as you can see, that's where I've got my cable plugged in down there, because that's where you need to plug in to get CarPlay. There is another charge port over this side, a USB, but it's just for charging. So it looks pretty nice. It's just not as user-friendly as it could be. So is the back seat user-friendly? Before we jump to the back, there's one more thing I wanted to point out, actually two more things. I hate that you can see that there's a rough edge to this plastic cutaway across the dashboard underneath that screen. It just cheapens it a bit. And when you get out, this, can you hear that? This car's only got 600 kilometers on it. That's not good enough. Now back seat. Okey doke, I'm 182 centimeters or six foot tall and this seat is set for me. Look how much room I've got. That's comfortable. That's plenty of space for an adult. Even someone really big could be comfortable back here. Although they might not want to be too heavy because these seats are super squishy and they don't actually have that much support in the base. So uh, depending on what you expect when you sit in the back seat of a car, you might find it a little bit too soft. I think it's quite comfortable though. And there are child seat anchor points as well. So you've got these ISOFIX points in the window seats and three top tether points too, which is great. There's also directional air vents. You've got a pair of USB ports. Storage is pretty good too. You've got a couple of map pockets. You've got these door pockets down here. There's a flip down armrest with some cup holders as you'd expect, but there are some cheaper materials on the tops of the doors. But generally the space is really good even with this panoramic roof in the ultra version. There's always going to be a compromise when you choose a coupe style SUV over the wagon. And in the case of the H6, it's pretty evident. This car has 392 liters of boot capacity with five seats up, which is down more than 200 liters over the regular H6 wagon. If you fold those seats down, you still get a fair amount of space, but it's not going to be as roomy as the regular H6 or most other SUVs at this price point. Now in terms of overall size, the H6 GT is bigger in every dimension except the wheelbase compared to the regular H6 wagon. In fact, it's bigger than it looks, bigger than a Mitsubishi Outlander or Honda CRV. Both of those vehicles have up to seven seats available and bigger boots as well. But you're hardly buying a coupe style SUV if you want the most practical model in the range, are you? So has it got anything interesting under the bonnet? Hmm, what's this? That looks yummy. 
And this, well, oh, that's not supposed to come off. It's a two litre four cylinder turbocharged engine under there. It's the same engine, in fact, as the regular H6. And that could be a problem for some customers because there's no extra power and no extra torque. And there's no difference to the powertrain at all. It's still available with the choice of two wheel drive or front wheel drive or an all wheel drive version, which is this one. And both versions have a seven speed dual clutch automatic transmission, a bit like a Volkswagen or Skoda, but just not quite as good. And I'll tell you more about that when we go for a drive. So is the Havel H6 GT as sporty to drive as it is to look at? In short, no. That's because it's just the H6, and I've already told you all of this, but just with a sportier look. So what that means is you still get a relatively punchy two litre four cylinder engine. And yeah, it's turbocharged, so there is a bit of whoosh to it. And sure, it's not the biggest firecracker of an engine out there, but it offers reasonably good power and torque delivery. What isn't as good as it could be is the seven speed dual clutch automatic transmission. As I mentioned before, that's like what you find in a Skoda or Volkswagen, but this one just isn't quite as refined as what you will find from those more expensive, more, I guess, premium models. That isn't to say that it's a terrible transmission. I've certainly driven worse dual clutch autos, but it is just a bit slurry and a bit slow to react and just not quite as sharp a tool as it could be. Now, there's also in this Ultra model, a bunch of different drive modes, including a race mode, which seems really silly. And it is really silly. I've set it up as a favorite on the steering wheel and it makes the exhaust get a bit louder and the throttle response get a bit sharper. Transmission get a little bit more aggressive, but honestly, you shouldn't even bother with it. It's not that smart and it's not that fun. And I guess that's one thing that's let me down a bit about this car. It's just not that fun to drive. Part of that, and a big part of that comes down to the steering, which is too slow. And even in the sportiest mode, which just adds more weight to the steering, it just isn't quick enough. Like a Honda CRV has quicker, more engaging steering than this. And it's hardly a sports car. So, what else is good about it? Well, the ride's pretty good. The suspension doesn't muck around too much over bumpy sections of road. If you hit some sharp edges, like a pothole or a speed bump, you are gonna feel it in the cabin. We've said it before, and I'll say it again. Havel could do with local tuning. And what I mean by that is, the brand could follow the steps of Hyundai and Kia and invest in making their cars more palatable to Australian tastes. Aussie roads are unique and you can find a lot of shortcomings with cars like this because they just haven't been tailored to suit what our conditions represent. Our roads are nothing like the roads in China, for instance. And as a result, this car could drive better. It could have a better ride. It could steer much better. And also, those safety systems could do with some serious fine tuning. What it could all amount to is a better driving car than the one we have here, because the one we have here could drive a lot better. On your screen now, you'll see the official combined cycle fuel consumption figure, and it depends on whether you choose the base model Lux, which has a lower claim than the ultra all wheel drive by almost a litre per 100 Ks. During my time in the H6 GT ultra all wheel drive, I saw a return pretty high compared to those official claimed numbers. Maybe I indulged in that race mode just a bit too much. Just like the regular Havel H6 SUV, the H6 GT coupe style model has the same five-star ANCAP safety rating from testing in 2022. So it's a really fresh score and that means it's got plenty of active safety technology and there's a lot to it. So if you wanna know all the nitty gritty details, it'd be too boring for me to go through here, read it in my written review at the Cars Guide site. You'll find the link in the description. And if you're wondering about that autonomous parking system that the Ultra model gets, you can watch it by clicking this link at the top of your screen and that'll take you to our comparison test with the Havel H6 hybrid against some of its closest rivals. 
the on-paper ownership experience for the Havel H6 seems pretty good. In fact, the warranty cover is up there with the best in Australia right now, a seven year unlimited kilometer warranty plan. Plus there's five years of roadside assist and a five year capped price service plan. Now the first service interval is a bit unusual at 12 months or 10,000 kilometers. And then every service after that, it's every 15,000 Ks or annually. Now there is a bit of a price difference when it comes to the service pricing for the two wheel drive versus the all wheel drive. And if you want to know those details, you're going to have to read my review. So there you have it. That's a rundown on the Havel H6 GT, a sporty looking coupe style SUV that could afford to be a little bit more sporty to drive. Tell us what you think in the comments section below. Would you still choose this car or would you choose something that it competes against or maybe even a more practical regular SUV? If you're wondering what I'm thinking, here's my score. Thanks for watching.